Hi, I'm James York, and I'm the founder of Worry and Peace and the current co-chair of InsureTech UK, the trade association. The title of my talk today is, If You're Different, Be Different. And I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me such a broad canvas to establish what on earth I was going to talk about. They asked for some practical takeaways and war stories on my journey so far. And look, it has been a journey of, of time and effort, undeniably. I've been a one-man band for a long time in the industry. Worry and Peace started out selling lots of different insurances, and it's been on quite a journey. Ultimately, mine's different to the venture world. The venture world popped up around me. I didn't have a co-founder, I didn't have a CTO. And the takeaways from that have been something, frankly and honestly, I wouldn't trade. And you know that's true, because I'm not pitching to you right now, nor am I looking for capacity. By the way, I should say, if I look around the room while I'm doing this, just humor me. It's really tough doing these conference presentations to a camera on your own in a room in the middle of the back end of a pandemic. So my first takeaway from selling lots of insurance is it took too long. And let me elaborate on the examples I was giving you. When I first set up Worry and Peace, I thought quite logically, I could sell lots of insurances and I managed to get a few products to market by building supply chains quite quickly, very quickly in fact. And I put them all in one place and I built some technology around it. Now, the problem I realized from that was that I put three or four niche products in one place and it looked like we were a bigger brand than we were because we'd executed it you know, quite attractively and quite well relative to the world as it were five years ago. That was a problem. I was up against brands that have more marketing firepower, better customer service, and ultimately, if I'm honest, better products. Because when you're new to the party, oftentimes, get given a poor product. But the very first product that I put live took 14 months to get live. The first meeting had two people, the last 14 stakeholders. Too many, it was the wrong way around. There always seemed to me to be a fundamental risk aversion from the better product creators to work with innovation. It was almost like asking a potter to build you a lovely bowl, but giving them one to glaze or giving them a half-finished bowl that they can just polish off on the wheel with a bit of water. You need to give people the wheel and the clay and the water and let them dream and trust that the output of their workshop will be good for your business. I know this is true because I've seen how long it takes insurance companies and how much it takes insurance companies, it should be noted, to do the same things, probably not as well. So if you're not doing things as well and spending 10 times as much, you can definitely afford to lose six or seven bets out of that 10 for the four or five that work, right? That math doesn't work, but that's an entrepreneur's pitch for you. You should be betting on more things and you should be prepared that some of them are going to fail because that's the point of innovation. But you've got to learn and you've got to iterate. Now, my story goes from putting multiple brands in one place and observing that niche players were doing really well, thanks very much, with just single product silos. So what we did at Worry and Peace was disperse those products into product brands. And this really started the transition of Worry and Peace into what it's about to become, which I'll tell you further in the story. Worry and Peace sat behind product brands. And then it started to power a stack of technology. And it was here where the, the birth, the light bulb of biocentricity started to become an obsession. But my conclusion from that phase of putting everything in one place to then putting it in their own niche places and powering it and you know having to seek shorter supply chains or longer supply chains for different trade-offs in time and quality was that delegated authority can be good and it can be bad. Now, the good people that offer delegated authority should really think of the people they're working with as artists that they're commissioning, just like Netflix and Amazon Prime commission programs from expert producers. Unless you think you can do it better and do it in-house, trust them and give them the pen and let them craft it in the right way. Otherwise, you might fail bigger than you could ever imagine you would fail small. The second takeaway I had from this journey as I was trying to sell three or four insurance policies and then adding products to it, we built an insurance wallet that existed across these niche sites that we built. The idea was that you could come into any node on this mini network of niche brands and still have the same back office working. We acknowledged at that point that even though we sold four or five insurances across the piece to varying degrees of quality and success, I will grant you, that people would be buying other insurances from elsewhere. So why not allow our tools to be more open and used by them for those purposes? That was where this buyer centricity obsession started to really rumble loudly, like a volcanic eruption emerging. The wallet we built could potentially be used for other things, but we noticed elsewhere in the market, 
everyone was obsessed with owning the buyer. Now, don't get me wrong, we were obsessed with owning the buyer for the things that we sold to them, but we also acknowledged that we represented a tiny sliver of that buyer's risk world. And to be buyer-centric meant that we realized that we owned a small part of their attention and we didn't own the opportunity or the right, more importantly, to try and sell everything else to them. If insurance is sold and not bought, the first journey to biocentricity in the digital age is to potentially go through those hard yards that we did as well and look at your buyer through their lens, empathize with their journey and really know what you're selling versus everyone else. And that was really interesting, that spread of everything in one place to all the niches, to the middle ground, to the journey to biocentricity. That spread has been something I wouldn't trade for the world, but there was a lot of bumps and scrapes on the way. I promise you that. So worry and peace now is looking at this spread of selling everything in one place to selling lots of niches to connecting everything. We removed ourselves from the supply chain. Worry and peace has become something far more social. And look, rest assured, I'm, I'm happy to admit it's a pivot. And it was a pivot that I could only have gotten to and learned about and become obsessed about by trying to sell insurance across that journey I'd mentioned. We had a bunch of technology that we'd elevated to be a common denominator. It's a natural evolution to look at that and say, well, how many more nodes can we add to this common platform? Is it a network? And how does that work when you consider who owns the buyer? So that's what we're doing. We're connecting the industry. Worry and Peace has now evolved, pivoted, however you want to call it, I don't care, to become a commission-free social network for insurance. And that makes perfect sense to me through my biocentricity lens because ultimately it is a social network insurance. We've got a pool of strangers paying together for the risks of the few that become activated by bad luck. Wonderful but everyone's a stranger to each other in their own risk pools. And certainly the providers are very defensive about who knows who, who's with who, and who's paying what claims. Now I understand that, and I understand the role of the distribution in that, but by removing ourselves from the need to sell, we could become an arbitrator and a guide rail for the industry. Buyers and providers can connect across those tracks on the platform that we've built. And what is it? Well, it's a permanent wallet for your insurance, and it's supported by reviews and feedback software and a search engine that personalizes results based on reviews and feedback. And ultimately, it doesn't get any simpler than that. Putting the buyer in one permanent place for any insurance from anywhere, giving any provider the ability to create user-generated content like search results and reviews, and also give the buyer an ability to learn from their own personalizations. No one remembers who they didn't choose three years ago. Well, our platform will, and it will improve things based on the big data that this network will connect. It's fantastically exciting. It's a different route to market, and it's certainly different to anything else that's been tried before in insurance, but it's born from selling insurance. But along the way, as I've mentioned to you, I realized that I wasn't in the venture world. I thought I was, and I was an insure tech to all extents and purposes, but I wasn't treated like one. And honestly, I don't think I understood what venture was. I thought I was building a venture, but I was building a business. And there's a fundamental difference to that. And that's something to bear in mind for those innovating in insurance. When you're approached by a company that on paper looks wildly unstable and chaotic, what are they doing it for? What are they building and what are they creating? Along the way, I realized that reputation and network in insurance were absolutely everything. And that for the first time, it dawned on me that perhaps if I tried doing something that wasn't just about me and what I wanted and my own greed, maybe that would have a good effect to show people my good intentions because there was a huge amount of goodwill along the journey, along the way. I call this selfishly unselfish. And it's basically where you earn trust by creating goodwill, by doing things that don't initially benefit your core mission. Let's put some meat on that bone. Building a community, InsureTech UK. I sat in the room and pitched to the first 20 people the idea of InsureTech UK. But you'd be surprised, the minute that that oxygen was created, the minute that the words and the pitch came out of my mouth, something changed. Stakeholders rallied to the banner, breathed in the oxygen, breathed out more, and that magic word synergy definitely happened. Humble origins, 25 odd companies creating something. The next year consolidated to 50 to 60 companies. Now, two to three years on, 
we're projecting more influence and starting to dream a little bit more with over 110 members and some fantastic key partners from across the sector. Building that community was one of the best things I ever did because it allowed me to meet other people and like minds in the market that felt the same way about the industry as I do. And do you know what? It was hard and it had its problems. And oftentimes you're looking at it thinking, am I dedicating my time to the right things here? But if we look at the great innovators across the pond in Silicon Valley, they're big believers in doing things that are outside core because they give you a different perspective. Steve Jobs used to get design inspiration by going to art galleries and looking at architecture. We need to get the same inspiration in insurance from doing things that aren't just about selling insurance. If insurance is sold, not bought, something's going wrong with the way we're looking at the world. We're too selfish. Let's be unselfish because ironically, it actually comes back to you in the form of goodwill and good reputation. This is really key. What are you in the industry? I see the industry as one thing. Insurance, the insurance sector, comprises of multiple parts. Graduates see the industry and think, nah, don't want to work there. But they'll look at the accounting industry and see consultants with many branches. There's been an excellent branding exercise going on with our white collar peers in the services economy. And we need to step up to plate and realize that we sell one risk supply chain, insurance. The concept of insurance is co-owned by all the tribes, whether they're in loss adjusting, claims, underwriting, MGA, or distribution advisory commercial, or distribution delegated. And that's where I see major change needed. And InsureTech UK, for me, allows that. We've really started removing that zero association and reaching out hands of friendship. It's not always been as successful as we would like because office politics is always a factor. But InsureTech and digital is the common problem and the common opportunity for the sector. And it should be something that allows us to quarterback a voice for the industry and a brand and a reputation for the industry with government and with buyers in a much more efficient and measured way. So become an evangelist, believe in insurance. And this is the moment where I tell you honestly, and again, I'm not pitching for investment or your capacity. I think insurance is, is amazing. When you consider it, it relates to every single thing in the economy. And yes, with a younger, smaller, whatever you want to call it, sibling to banking, but it would be obtuse for that to be otherwise. Banking creates wealth, insurance transfers some of that and mitigates bad luck, so wealth can keep on being created without economic loss. It's fine for us to follow in their wake, learning from their mistakes. But what we need to realize is the power of insurance. And I've seen it firsthand. I was a one-man band business hosted by one of the largest insurance companies in the UK and the world. And I saw a company that decided to go digital under a former CEO. And they didn't just chuck the kitchen sink at it. They chucked an entire building, lots and lots of talent and a heap of resource. And that inspired me. It made me think of a, a town that might need regeneration in my country or your country. And the fact that insurance is, albeit smaller than banking, still sitting on a huge amount of capital and a huge amount of opportunity. If insurance was to create opportunities, all of those opportunities created will need insurance themselves. We don't play a role in that world. We're always the silent partner in the economy, but the economy can't work without us. And it doesn't take a, a raw, unashamed capitalist to tell you that. It's just common sense. So find a network. Build some selfishly unselfish things. Look back at your practicalities on how you're innovating and create choice for yourself on strategic and tactical levels. And that's absolutely critical. Risk with gusto. This is the key message. I'm leaving this at quite a lot of my talks at the moment. Just be open to change. You know, it's actually about finding a destiny for the sector. In the digital world, we're closer and more frictionless to buyers than we ever expected and ever hoped. And we're not quite embracing those opportunities in ways that really empathize with what we're selling and who we're selling to. We have an insecurity problem in our industry generally. Hopefully some of the takeaways from my journey can help you shape your innovation journey or your personal career. Be selfishly unselfish. Create choice. Allow the creators to be artists. Be patient with them. Have realistic expectations. And above all, find the biocentricity message in your organization crush the owning the buyer mindset, own some of the buyer, and you'll be much better off. Thanks very much.